so on the Canvas page, there's a couple things I want to show you. The modules. So I went down to modules, one of the last uh, choices on the left side. And we did 10.5 yesterday. So on the 10.5 modules page here, this will be lectures I did, I think, last summer I made all these. But these will be the recordings for basically the entire, all the material that we do in the class. So we're going to graph tangent and cotangent now. All right. Sounds fun. And we don't know what it looks like. It's going to look different than the other four graphs that we just <coughs> got through. So we're going to do the There we go. And, and one. So that's just the first. All right. So there's for tangent. And then I do some examples at the end. Oh, chicken tractors. Those are fun. <laughs> we should look at that because that looks actually really fun. Oh, yeah. Chicken tractors are awesome. Or does that even mean? We have to look that up. It's not. It's not on the syllabus. I'm sorry. You have to look it up. It's not in the index of your pre-calculus book. <laughs> Unlike most of the other things I talk about. All right, quiz three is not graded, but I have your solution key online. It'll be graded today. Here are some different. Oh no, this happened last class too. Hopefully it works better on your computer. It just went to some gray screen. All right, so I'm not going to scroll down. Hopefully it won't mess it up. It's supposed to be quiz number three. I made a mistake and wrote quiz four on it. But I have different ways to solve the identity. There are all other ways to do it, just not ones that I was thinking of when I was making the answer key. So it's possible you did it correctly, even if it's not similar to one of these two uh, proofs. Uh, here is two different. You can either use the sum difference formula for the sign, or you can use half angles. And either way, I uh, have both ways to do it. You don't have to do both solutions. You only have to go one of the two ways. So whichever way you went, as long as it's somewhat similar to these, is good. And discussions. Ooh, that's invisible. That's not good. Published. All right, practice exam question and answers. This is where you can ask and answer questions about the practice exam, which is found right on the home page, down where it says something like practice exam. There we go, practice exam right there. And I think on the announcement I said number one through 10. So all the way up through it with the graphs of sine and cosine. So they should be somewhat familiar. If they're not familiar, hopefully they'll become familiar by Thursday morning. A bunch of identities to prove. Uh, so don't do the uh, inverse cosine or any of the 11 through the end. We haven't done those yet, so don't worry about those right now. So where to go for help on this? So let's say that I want to graph this number nine right here. So I'm going to copy it and go over here to Desmos, get these graphs out of here. So I'm going to try to paste it in here and see what happens. Uh Oh, they don't like it. Sorry to understand this. Uh oh. Do you understand it now? That looks pretty similar. Oh. Well, we'll just, all right, maybe copying and pasting is not a great idea here. So <clears throat> you're going to have to be careful about the zoom that you use and the window. It's going to measure generally not in multiples of pi. So if you look at the values right here, for example, this minimum right here I think is pi over 2, which is a very tiny bit bigger than 1.5. So you want to... 
you can set up your graph to scale step. If I do something like pi over 2. There we go. So I change a step to pi over 2. So you can see things as multiples of pi. That's going to be useful, especially if we're going to use pi over 4 or pi over some other weird uh, denominator. You want to change that so it's not measured in decimals. It's measured in multiples of pi. Then hopefully it'll make a lot more sense when you look around. Ah, pi over 2. And the next one's happening at pi. That vertical asymptote will be 3 pi over 4 right there. And then the other one, the other vertical asymptote right here would be pi over 4. And that comes from the period was normally 2 pi, but this period will be compressed to just pi because of that too. So Desmos is a really good graphing tool that I recommend you use. And Wolfram is going to help you on a lot of the other problems. So it's desmos.com to get uh, graphs. Let's take another problem and not a graphing one. Wolfram is good for straightforward questions like what is the tangent of 17 pi over 3? Very good at that. So this is wolframalpha.com. And again, pi is spelled P-I, but I'm sure you learned that in web work very quickly. There we go, exact results, negative square root 3. Of course, this doesn't tell you how it got there. It will just tell you where there is. Uh, if I just do 17 pi over 3 and ask for the reference angle, It understands things pretty well. So there we go, pi over 3. And it draws the <coughs> big spiral right there. Now I want to do like 170 pi over 3 and see what it draws. No, they didn't even bother. It's a lot of rotations to spin around. Anyways, that can give you some uh, help on some of these problems. It won't uh, help you prove identities at all. That's something you just have to practice. Questions more like number four. It may not answer these so easily because there's a lot of information to enter. So some of them is going to be less useful on. And this questions like number four are good questions for the discussion forum if you're wondering if you're right or wrong. And I do have your other. Hopefully you've been looking at the other quiz keys. If you got less than a 9, I strongly recommend that you look at the quiz keys to make sure that you see what uh, mistakes you made. And I'm going to give you your cheat sheet on your uh, midterm. So just keep in mind you'll get all these equations also. <coughs> so another thing from the notes. If you view the notes, don't do it in Microsoft Edge because for some reason Microsoft Edge just can't read their own web page, their own OneNote web page. But Firefox and Chrome work really well here and most other places. So here's the notes from class. What I recommend that you look at in the notes <coughs> taking a while. All right, let's just jump to 10.2. So when this finally comes up, I'm going to just look through for the example problems because those will be similar to what I'm going to ask you on the midterm. So this can take a while to load, and it's demonstrating that right now really well. If you, you probably won't be signed in as me, hopefully, but up in this upper right corner, you'll be able to sign in as yourself if you have a Microsoft account, and you can get the app, the OneNote app on your smartphone, and it will synchronize if you set it up and I think like subscribe or add this notebook, you'll be able to update on your phone or tablet or whatever device you use. If you've got a Windows computer, you can download the full OneNote app 
and open it up in there, but it just lets you uh, browse it a lot faster if you have it on, your, on the app instead of the web page. But for example, here we go. This is one example right here. So this could be similar to a uh, midterm problem. So you want to go through and make sure you can answer the example questions in here and just cover up the actual solution and see if you can get there yourself. And going back and rewatching all the lectures will probably take way too long, but going back through the notes should be much, uh, much shorter because you can go at your own pace. You don't have to go at the pace that I, that I go. All right, so we got Wolfram Alpha and Desmos. So let's get back. So inverse trig functions are absolutely not on your midterm. So your midterm ended, all the material for your midterm ended yesterday. So this is not on your midterm. And what we talk about tomorrow is not going to be in your midterm either. So before we talk about inverse trig functions, let's just talk about functions in general for a minute. And then we'll talk about inverse functions. And then jump into the actual trig functions. So there is one function rule. Who remembers the one function rule? It's the only thing you need to satisfy to be a function. It's pretty close. So what about, so if we have an input, an x, uh, an input, what does f have to, what does f have to satisfy, or what property does f have to have for each input? One output. Uh, this word one is really important. It can't have zero outputs, and it can't have two or three or four or more outputs. So it's got to have exactly one output. So this is just to be a function, you have to pass this rule. Now we are going to look at a one, well, so this is also known as the vertical line test. And the idea is if you have a function, and uh, even if it's something kind of crazy like the sine function, if you pass a vertical line across it, you intersect at most one point. So you never intersect two or more places. So that is uh, how you become a function. You just have to have each input as one output. So now we're going to look at one to one functions. So the difference between a regular function and a one-to-one -one function, in a one-to-one -one function, each input has a unique output, meaning outputs can't be reused. So an output value has, has a unique input value. So that's how you get a one-to-one -one function. Algebraically, if f of x1 equals f of x2, meaning if the outputs match, then x1 has to equal x2. So that's the algebraic test for a one-to-one -one function. So just off this little graph right here, this little wave graph, is just this graph one to one. No. Nope, I can take, let's say this y value. So we got one point here, another point here, another point here. We got four points, four inputs sharing the same output, the same y value. So this is definitely not a one to one function. What it also means is all the trig functions are not one to one. 
So what we're going to do is basically cut them up to only tiny little pieces so that that little tiny piece is one to one. So all trig functions, none of them are one to one. One to one's a lot to write, so we're just going to use one dash one. So I mean one to one. So none of the trig functions are one to one. So the th so theorem F has an inverse which we're gonna write as f, and it looks like it is a negative first power, but in this case, when you apply that to a function, it's talking about the inverse function, which I'll get into in a minute. So f has an inverse, which is written f inverse, exactly when f is one to one. So what in the world is an inverse function? We looked at this in pre-calculus 1. So normally your function will go from one set to another. And if you ask this function f what set is on the left, that function will tell you, hey, that's the domain of f. And what set's on the right, that's the range of f. The inverse function goes the exact opposite direction. It goes from the original range back to the domain. And the idea is if you start out over here with some point and you f it, it's going to land over here in f of x. And if you then apply f inverse, it's going to go back to where it started. So the idea is f inverse undoes whatever f does. So it's the inverse or the opposite function. So if you ask f inverse what set is on the right side, f inverse will tell you that's the domain of f inverse. That's my domain. And if you ask f inverse what's the set on the left side over here, f inverse will tell you that's my range. That's the output of f inverse. So this means the domain of f is the same as the range of f inverse, and the range of f is the same as the domain of f inverse. So they swap their domain and range, because you're just turning the arrows backwards. So algebraic properties of inverse functions. So if you have f of x and then you apply f inverse, the idea is it's going to undo whatever f did in the first place. So it's going to cancel out. f inverse and f are going to cancel out, not to 0 or 1, but cancel out to x. And if we apply them in the other order, So if you take f inverse first, and then f, it's also going to cancel out to x. <coughs> so f and f inverse cancel each other, either order. So these are the properties of inverse functions. You have to be a little bit careful right here. Actually, I'm going to move this down. I want to write something different here. You can't do that. So this is going to be when x is in the domain of f 
just looking in here, x has to be a valid input for uh, the f function. And the second one, x has to be a valid input for f inverse. You just look at who's eating first. So in this case, the first one, f is eating first. And the second case, f inverse is eating first. And you just have to make sure that that, is, that x value is a valid input for the inner function. All right, so now we know some uh, background for inverse functions. And we're going to look at specifically our trig functions. We'll start with cosine. So graph out one period of cosine. And just graph the standard period that you've been graphing for a while. Leave a little space on the left. You may need it. So even just with one period, is cosine 1 to 1? Are there two different inputs that have the same output? There's lots of inputs with the same output. I think the easy one to see is probably the y value of 1 has two inputs right here. So what we're going to do is start erasing parts of the graph until we have a 1 to 1 graph. So I'm going to switch to my eraser. So I want to think, how far can I go to the right before I stop being one to one? <coughs> how far can I go to the right before I'm no longer one to one? So I can go through pi over 2. I can go all the way down to pi. However, if I go anywhere past pi, I'm going to fail to be 1 to 1. So what I'm going to do is basically erase everything that I didn't just shade over right here. So I'm going to erase that entire part on the right side. And I'm just going to make it dotted lines instead. So I'm going to throw away all that part of the function. This cosine function does keep going to the left. It, I can keep drawing it to the left. But again, if I draw anything to the left, I'm not going to be 1 to 1. So the only part of this function I'm going to keep is the part between 0 and pi. So we're going to restrict the domain. <coughs> So any questions about making this one-to-one -one by cutting up the domain? So we're only keeping a tiny little part of the domain, 0 to pi. So what we're going to do now is label the three points we have on our graph. So our first point is 0, 1. Our x-intercept is pi over 2, 0. And our last point is pi negative 1. So I'm just writing down the coordinates for those three points. So when we invert a graph, we are swapping the x and y axis and swapping the x and y coordinates. This is the same as reflecting across the line x equals y. So you can also see this happen. The line x equals 
equals y, that's a line with a slope 1 and a y-intercept of 0. So there's line x equals y or y equals x, however you want to think of it. So when we reflect, we're going to get a shape that is going to be, well, I don't want to sketch it out right here, but we'll very carefully take these three points and flip their coordinates around. So we write cos inverse the same way we write f inverse. Just put a negative 1 exponent in there. So I'm going to very carefully swap x and y coordinates. So instead of the point 0, 1, we got the point 1, 0. So I'm just taking x, y coordinates and changing the order around. That's all. So instead of 0, 1, we get 1, 0. So that'll be 1, 0. Next up pi over 2, 0. When we swap out the coordinates, is 0, pi over 2. So it's going to be up on the y-axis at pi over 2. Last point is pi negative 1. We swap the coordinates. It's going to be negative 1 and go up pi. So those are the three points where we swap the coordinates. And the last thing we're going to do is connect the three points together with a curve. Now, if you have some visual artistic skills, this won't be so bad. You can see it happening up here in the top. Just carefully reflect it. Uh, basically, this curve, this part of the curve right here is going to look pretty similar when you reflect it. It's not going to look that different. So it's going to look kind of like that, right there. And then the other part of the curve is going to look like that. So that's the mirror image across the orange line right there. So this is the graph of cos inverse of x. We're ready to write down the domain and the range. All right, we'll do the range first. What is the range of cosine inverse? Zero to pi. So we're just looking at y value zero to pi. I could have answered that earlier because the range of the inverse is the same as the domain of the original. So I knew the range as soon as I wrote down the original domain. And now we'll look at the domain. What is the domain of this inverse function? Domain of the inverse function. Negative 1 to 1. We're taking all the x values, all the input values. I think that's all we need here. <clears throat> We're going to look at the cancellation properties now. So they will cancel, but we have to be sure that the inside function, the function that's eating first, is allowed to eat that x value. So in the first case, what is the domain of cos inverse? So the first one will be true as long as x is uh, allowed to be an input for cos inverse. So as long as x is in the domain of cos inverse, we got the domain right there, negative 1 to 1.
So when x is between negative 1 and 1, you can cancel cosine of cosine inverse. Now we're going to look at the second. So I have to make sure that the inner function can uh, input the x value. Now, we didn't use the original domain of cosine. We trimmed it down. So the domain of regular cosine, the cosine function that we used, we restricted the domain down to 0 to pi. So that means we still have to follow that here. So it's only going to have an inverse if you stick between 0 to pi. So these are our cancellation properties.